Welcome to NOAA Live. My name is Nicole Bartlett, and I'm going to be moderating today's webinar. This series is sponsored by NOAA's Regional Collaboration Network, where I work, which is spread across the country and helps connect people to all that NOAA does. Our amazing partner is Woods Hole Sea Grant, located at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution here on Cape Cod, Massachusetts. To find out about future webinars, you can look on the Woods Hole Sea Grant Education tab on their webpage or simply follow them on Facebook. This is the 24th webinar and the eighth week in a series designed to help you get to know NOAA and some of our incredible experts during these months of school closures. All of our speakers work for some part of NOAA, and those veterans on the uh, line will recognize that as NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Today, we are introducing you to Sean Waugh with the National Severe Storms Laboratory in Norman, Oklahoma. While we'll be talking about NOAA's role in tornado research, we want to recognize that we are all coming to you from the traditional lands of Native communities who have substantial traditional and local knowledge and much to share with us. Sean comes to us from the land of the Creek and Seminole peoples. We are hosting this webinar from the ancestral lands of the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe and the Wampanoag tribe of Gayhead Aquina. A few guidelines before I hand you over to our speaker. You're all muted because we have a lot of people on the line and we want to make sure everyone can hear Sean. However, there is a box where you can write questions. Some of you have already located that. We encourage you to ask them as we go and I'll be keeping track for Sean and he'll stop now and again and answer some. We may not get to all your questions, but we'll try to answer as many as we can. All right, Sean, I'm turning it over to you. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Uh, as it was said, my name is Dr. Sean Waugh, and I am a severe storms researcher at NOAA's National Severe Storms Laboratory, which is located in Norman, Oklahoma. And it's actually located in the National Weather Center building, which is on the southern end of the University of Oklahoma's campus. And I actually attended the University of Oklahoma for 11 years of college, 11 whole years, working on three degrees, bachelor's, a master's, and a PhD in meteorology. So I've been doing this for a while. And before we dive into things, you know, we are going to talk about tornadoes and severe weather research and things like that. And this is a subject that I'm really, really passionate about. And I've wanted to be a meteorologist my entire life. In fact, my earliest memory goes back to, I think I was about four years old, actually. I was on my grandfather's farm and, and he was a farmer up in central Kansas. And he was worried because there was a hailstorm that was coming in and he was watching the news and the, the weather forecaster on the news was basically saying that it was going to be really bad. And he was worried it was going to damage his crops. And it ended up not happening. And it, you know, frustrated him. And he was like, you know, those meteorologists are always wrong. And I looked up to him and I said, Grandpa, I'm going to I'm going to grow up and I'm going to be a meteorologist someday and I'm going to forecast the weather and I'm going to be right. And he was like, well, you're going to make a lot of money because you'll be the only one. And, and it just stuck with me. And it's something that I've always wanted to be. And I never really deterred off of that. So it's been a passion of mine basically for my entire life. And, and I think that's kind of what helps me, you know, drive forward with a lot of the research that we do. So let's jump right into it. You know, I'm a severe storms researcher, but what does that mean? You know, what do we actually do as a severe storms researcher? And, you know, there's obvious things like lightning. Lightning comes along with severe storms. So we do study lightning and what forms it and, you know, how it propagates through or moves through the atmosphere. Um, we also study hail, and that's something that I do a lot of work in and how big it gets and their sizes and shapes and where it falls and how often it falls and things like that. We do a lot of hurricane work and there are a lot of people that study hurricanes and we focus on hurricanes when they make landfall and as they make that transition from a you know maybe a category three hurricane all the way down to a tropical depression as it impacts the coastline and all the people that have to experience and deal with that and we do a lot of studies on understanding how those systems move we also do flash floods flash floods affect a large portion of the country and the world for that matter and you know Flash floods can occur at almost any time, and sometimes they come without warning. So, you know, we're not without warning, but they can happen very, very quickly. So we do study those and try to better predict those and try to warn the public for those. But we also study tornadoes. You know, tornadoes are kind of the, the big thing that we're gonna talk about in, in this project here. And I do a lot of work with tornadoes, trying to understand like how they form and why they form where they do and how they move and why they ultimately dissipate. So that's gonna be kind of the focus of this talk is studying tornadoes. So where do tornadoes occur? 
and that picture kind of gave the answer away. But we'll go ahead and ask the question anyway. Where do where do you think tornadoes occur? Oklahoma, or maybe just the central part of the United States, or is it everywhere in the United States, but only in the U.S.? Or does it happen everywhere in the world? Does anybody have an answer? Well, um, Riley thinks it's D, and so does Ellie and James. And well, as you said, although somebody said tornado alley, um, somebody said B and D. Um, let's see, Olivia says Oklahoma. Um, and let's see, Alex says, we're getting some Bs, but I think a lot of people got your tip at the beginning that it, that it was D. It is actually <laughs> everywhere. Tornadoes can happen anywhere in the world at any time. Just because you live in a different country or, you know, a different part of, you know, the United States, it can happen as long as the conditions are there for those tornadoes to happen. They might even happen on Antarctica. We just don't know because there's not very many people there to see them, but they might happen. So anywhere that those conditions come together to form a tornado, a tornado can happen. And as that map in the upper left shows right there, there are tornadoes on every continent on the, in the world. But if we focus on the U.S., which is where I do a lot of my work, um, every county in the United States, or not every county, but every state in the United States has had a tornado. And some of them aren't very many, you know, up in the northwest part of the United States, there's not too many tornadoes, but there are counties in there that have had at least a few. And somebody mentioned Tornado Alley. That's actually this green shaded area. And the reason why we call it Tornado Alley is just on a long time scale, that seems to be where we notice the most tornadoes happen the most frequently during a certain time of year. And it's kind of that central southern plains, you know, Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas, Colorado, Nebraska, all the way up into South Dakota. But that doesn't mean that's the only place where tornadoes happen. They can happen anywhere. And there's some other places in the country that have their own names for specific regions, like Dixie Alley, for example, which is in the southeast. So every state in the U.S. has a tornado. And I know we have somebody on here from Hawaii, and there are tornadoes in Hawaii and Alaska, for that matter. And I know this question got asked in a previous webinar during lightning from the weather service talk and somebody asked what's the most tornadoes that have ever happened in a single year and it turns out it wasn't that long ago it's just back in 2004 we had 1817 tornadoes in one year that's a lot of tornadoes and this is why we study them to try to better predict these hazards and try to warn the public of things like that when they're coming. So when do tornadoes occur you know we've got 12 months out of the year what what months are seem to be the most active? And it turns out most of our tornadoes happen between March and July. And this is for the United States, but about 70% of our tornadoes happen during those months. But there are tornadoes that can happen in other months of the year. So you need to be prepared for a tornado pretty much any time of year. But what about time of day? Is there a specific time of day that I need to be worried about tornadoes? And again, they can happen at any time, but most of our tornadoes, about two thirds or about 63%, seem to happen between about 3 p.m. and 9 p.m. And that's just because that's traditionally when those conditions become the most favorable for tornadoes. But there are tornadoes that can happen overnight. And those are the really dangerous ones because if it happens at three o'clock in the morning and you're asleep, maybe you're not watching the weather as closely. And those, that's why we need to work on our warning systems to try to better predict these and try to warn people in advance that things like this are gonna happen. So before we go on with this question, I did want to take a moment because I know you guys are really excited and that's great. Does anybody have any questions so far? Oh yes, we've got some questions, John. <laughs> so, um, so let's start with, uh, you just talked about the most tornadoes in a year. Cammie would like to know how many tornadoes were recorded last year? Ooh, last year, I am not actually certain of that. I don't keep track of the statistics or the number of tornadoes per year. I know that there are some people that work in the National Weather Service or the Storm Prediction Center, which are all divisions of NOAA, that they keep track of those. So I don't know that number off the top of my head. I'll, I'd be willing to bet someone's going to find out for us and let Probably. us know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so we'll pro I'll probably have that answer for you, Cammie, before uh, th this Q&A is out. Um, let's see, I know you're going to talk about how tornadoes form, so we're going to hold off on that one, Ryan, but it's coming up. Um, Riley and Zachary both want to know how many tornadoes have you seen? Ooh. So I've been studying tornadoes with the National Severe Storms Laboratory and with the University of Oklahoma for coming on about 15 years now. I don't know the exact number, but if I had to guess, I would probably say somewhere between 50 and 60 tornadoes that I have personally seen. That's that's a lot. It's about 
50 more than me. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, how, let's see, Connor and Daniel want to know, are you a storm chaser? So I do what's called storm chasing on my own time as a hobby. Um, and there is a difference there between storm chasing and the research that we do. But whenever we talk about storm chasing, that's something that, they, that I do on my own time. I take my own car, I pay for my own gas. And for me, that's really just a way to kind of understand the atmosphere. It's a learning tool for me because I do study this. Uh, but that's, there is a difference between research and the storm chasing that I do. Okay, we've heard from both Ellie and Taylor, and they'd like you to know that there were over 1,500 tornadoes in the U.S. last year. 1,522, according to Ellie. <laughs> um, okay, and uh, let's see, Zoe wants to know, how long do tornadoes last? That is an excellent question. Um, and the answer to that question is all lengths of time. We've seen tornadoes that have lasted just a few seconds that just barely touch down and then they're gone. And then there have also been tornadoes that have lasted hours and, and covered you know hundreds if not thousands of miles and have crossed multiple states sometimes these tornadoes can last a really 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 long time so that's something that we're trying to understand is what causes those tornadoes that happen and they're just there momentarily versus what makes one stay on the ground for a lot longer and we don't know the answer to that question yet all right, you have, we, I think we have time for one more. Um, I'm seeing a lot of questions that you're gonna get to. So like why tornadoes exist and why they happen in some places and not in others. So Sean's gonna talk about the conditions and, um, and uh, we have one question about, we just learned about hurricanes last week. We had someone on from the Hurricane Center. Um, and so uh, someone would like to know, do we name tornadoes the way we name hurricanes? We don't name tornadoes. Um, there are a lot of people that will refer to tornadoes based on a state maybe or a city or a year. And I have some friends of mine that are very, very good at that. And they're almost like an encyclopedia with tornadoes. If they can just spout off a tornado and you know a lot of statistics about them. But we don't actually name individual tornadoes, no. All right, good questions, kids. Keep them coming. Sean's gonna, we're gonna let Sean continue and we'll break in a little bit. Well, I have one question for you guys, and it's been up on the screen for a little bit, so maybe you guys have had a chance to think about that. And, you know, we've been talking about tornadoes, and there was a question about how long that they're on the ground. But some of you might know that we actually rate tornadoes. We don't name them, but we give them a rating. And what do you think that rating's based off of? Is it based on how big they are? Or, you know, maybe how fast the wind speeds are? Is it based on the amount of damage that they cause? Or maybe it's how many photos we see of them on social media. What do you guys think? Um, let's see. So Kylie and Paul both think it's damage. So does Susan. Um, Connor and Daniel think it's B and C. Uh, Taylor thinks it's B, Cami B. So we're looking at like wind speed or damage seems to be the most common right now. Um, yeah, that seems to be the consensus I'm getting. I don't see, I see one A just for, uh, Rebecca wants to make sure I get that out there, but mostly, <laughs> Mostly B or C, Sean. Okay. Well, it turns out the actual answer is C, damage. But wind speed is a really, really good guess. And the reason why you might think that it's wind speed is we rate tornadoes based on what's called the enhanced Fujita scale or the EF scale. And that used to just be called the Fujita scale or the F scale. And that rating scale is based on damage. But that damage comes with an expected wind value associated with it because we expect that say a hundred mile an hour wind is going to cause a certain amount of damage to trees or different building types or vehicles and things like that. But the scale itself is actually based on damage. And that's important because that means a really, really big tornado that has you know 300 mile an hour winds in it. If it's out in the middle of a field and it doesn't really hit anything, it won't get a high rating because there wasn't any, any damage that it was associated with it. Conversely, you could also have a very small tornado that goes through a very dense populated area and causes a lot of damage, and it, it could get rated higher depending on what it hits. But the scale is actually based entirely off damage. And I do want to point out that when we look at those, those rating scales, you know, EF0 being the weakest one and EF5 being the top one and has the highest wind speeds that are estimated to be associated with it, about four out of five tornadoes actually occur in those first two categories. So most of our tornadoes are on the lower end of things. Those upper end, what we call you know, major or violent tornadoes, those are very, very, very rare. 
So we do see kind of this difference in, in statistics about what types of tornadoes occur. And they can occur all over the world and all in you know, different places in the country, you know, populated areas or rural areas. But we do try to keep track of those rating scales because that helps us in our research when we're, when we're trying to figure out you know, what leads to those destructive tornadoes. So we talk a lot about damage, you know, in, in the rating scale, and I just wanted to give you guys an idea of what that damage looks like. And here are six pictures. Um, these are all taken in Greensburg, Kansas, if anybody knows what that is, where there was an EF5 tornado that occurred a number of years ago. And, you know, on the upper left where that zero is, you can see that home really doesn't have a whole lot of damage. Maybe there's some shingles missing, you know, a broken uh, railing on the front porch and the tree looks a little worse for wear behind the house, but the house is relatively okay. But as you go through the numbers, you start seeing more and more and more damage. And then by the time you get to that four and five category, it looks like complete destruction. I mean, it's just chaos in those photos. And there's not really a lot of difference between those. And that's something that I wanted to stress is that, you know, a lot of people tend to get hung up on the numbers, you know, oh, it's only an EF1 tornado or, you know, it's an EF0. I, I don't have to pay attention to it until it's an EF3. Well, the point is, is that all these tornadoes can cause damage. So it's not really what rating it gets, which we can't even determine until afterwards, until it, you know, finishes and we can go out and we can survey the damage. But that there is a wide range of damage that can be caused. And these were all caused by the same tornado. Just one tornado caused all six of those photos. And you definitely don't want to take shelter in a car because cars are really not a safe place to be. It can mangle them, it can throw them. We see a lot of damage that happens to a car. So if you're ever in the path of a tornado, please don't take shelter in a car. Find a shelter, shelter in your house, you know, find somewhere else to be other than in your vehicle. So how do tornadoes form? And that wall cloud, we're going to talk about this video as it goes on, is one of the kind of first features that most people are used to identifying. And this is a video that I took, but that wall cloud that you see that's rotating right there, that's actually a downward extension of the rotation inside of a, a, a thunderstorm, or in this case, a supercell, which is a really, really strong thunderstorm that can produce tornadoes. And you can see it rotating. It's, the clouds are moving from left to right on the image there. And that rotation, that downward extension from the cloud base is what we identify as the wall cloud. And that's usually a pretty good precursor to the fact that, hey, you know, there's something going on in this storm. Maybe it's about to produce a tornado. And what was really interesting about this particular day is this day holds the record for the largest tornado in recorded history. And it doesn't show it in this video because this was kind of early on, but this tornado went on to become 2.6 miles wide. That's a really, really big tornado, and it had wind speeds over about 300 miles an hour. But as that video focuses in there, you can see kind of a secondary block lowering underneath things, and that's an even more concentrated version of that wall cloud. And that's showing that this tornado is actually really big because that larger circulation is, is pretty wide as it focuses down. But when you look down underneath, you can see some of these little tendrils that are, that are forming underneath things. There's one right here, and then right over the road, you see our next thing, which is the tornado. And it kind of moves and it skips around and it changes size and it changes shape. Um, and that's, that's part of why we study these things is we don't understand what causes those tornadoes to you know, move around and change size and shape and things like that. I hadn't finished, so I'm gonna go back. Um, we're gonna go to right here. But one of the other things that I want to point out, if this will play. Oh no! Hold on. Any good meeting is not without technical difficulties. Well, if you think you can multitask while that's restarting. Absolutely. Uh, uh, can, are you going to talk about how a tornado stops? So we don't know, actually. Uh, that's one of the things that we are trying to look at is what causes a tornado to actually stop and dissipate. Um, that's not an answer that we have right now, but that is something that we are actively researching. All right, thank you. Yeah, but one of the things that I want to point out why this video keeps going is if you've been watching that road that, that is nearby, there's a lot of traffic coming down that road, right? And this is not a place that you really want to be in a car. I mean, this is more or less in what is going to become the eventual path of this tornado as it moves, but there are a lot of people that are out on this road trying to get away, and that's not something that we encourage. You know, we don't want you to try to flee at the last minute, especially because tornadoes can do really different things like this. At one point, there are three separate circulations on the ground in that tornado that you just saw right there, and they change very, very quickly. And 
that evolution, and, and I think here it comes where it starts to get really, really big on the ground all of a sudden. That evolution is something that we're studying and we don't know the answers to those questions, but because of that, it's very unpredictable. So you don't want to be you know, in close proximity to something like this, trying to make a last second decision because it can do things that can catch you off guard or surprise you or you know, lead to problems. So you definitely don't want to be trying to make any like rush decisions at the last minute, you know, try to be prepared ahead of time. And we're going to talk about safety at the end of this video a little bit, but just wanted to let this clip kind of finish out right there. And we're going to pause for questions after this. So if anybody has any questions at this point, you know, maybe after this video, you can start throwing them into the chat and I'll answer them here in a second. I can't believe you took this video. <laughs> About how long uh, did you say how long a time period this was taken over? Uh, so this video spans about three minutes. Um, and while this video was going on, you know, we noticed that the tornado had moved um, from where, you know, we wanted it to be or not wanted it to be, but like where it was and where we were. And it put us into a position that I was no longer comfortable being in. So we ended up moving right after that. Interesting. Okay. Um, so I do have some questions. Um, and I've, and unfortunately, um, Kelly has been helping me out digging up a few stats for people who are very curious about the states with the most tornadoes. And um, I think we need to clear the air about one important tornado question, though. And, okay. and Sarah is asking it, but I think all of us want to know because probably everyone's seen The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> Everyone wants to know if you can live if you are picked up by a tornado. So it's definitely not a place I would want to be. Um, there are people that have been hit by tornadoes and have been moved by tornadoes, maybe from their house or you know things like that, that have survived. There are also a lot of people that haven't. So in any tornado, in any case, you know, like that, I mean, it, it goes the same with any natural disaster. You know, there are people that have been carried by floodwaters. That managed to survive and there are people that have been carried by floodwaters that haven't survived so there are there are people that have i don't think it's going to happen quite like it does in the movie you know the wizard of oz or, or things like that but there are people that have managed to survive yes okay great um and then this question these two questions from uh different kids kind of relate to each other so ollie is only five um but he wants to know how many tornadoes are in areas with people each year? And I think that relates to Lydia's question about whether tornadoes go mostly on fields with nothing on them. And so I think, could we talk about, you know, sort of tornadoes that happen? I think you talked about it a little bit with the, the damage um, ratings, but, um, you know, we hear about the ones that cause a lot of destruction and damage in highly populated areas, but how are those rare or are they um, occur more often? So tornadoes happen everywhere. They happen in open fields. They can happen in towns or cities. The fact that the city is there, and I'm gonna preface this with a, we don't know for sure, because there are people that are looking at this. We don't know if it has any effect on things. Um, there are people, and I, and I say that from the standpoint that the city itself, if you've ever heard the term heat island, for example, may play a role. We don't know. And these are sort of questions that we're really starting to kind of dig into the details. But tornadoes happen in fields and cities equally. Uh, it just kind of depends on when the tornado forms, when the conditions are there, what happens to be in front of its path as it goes on. So I don't think they target fields or that they target cities or, you know, avoid this city but hit that city. They definitely don't do that. Um, so we are a little more biased towards the ones that I think hit cities just because we hear about them more. Uh, there's more people there. There's more photos of it. You know, it's something that kind of grabs our attention a little bit more than the ones that happen out in the open field. But they happen everywhere. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I was muted for a second. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, the only other question uh, I had here is uh, someone wanted to know, it, can tornadoes have wind speeds of less than 65 miles per hour, or does that make them not a tornado? So according to our kind of rough definitions that we have on that low end, and that's where it starts to get a little fuzzy, there are circulations that look like a tornado that can have wind speeds lower than those. And, you know, that's when you start getting into things like land spouts or dust devils even. And we see those a lot, you know, on a hot summer day. 
And those are circulations. It's a rotating column of air. Um, you know, it does have some wind speeds associated with it, but it's not high enough to actually be, you know, classified as a tornado. So once you get below that threshold, it, it, it really has been found to not cause as much damage and we don't really classify it as a tornado now. I think you might get to this next question in your safety discussion, but um, a few folks want to know, why is it that in cartoons with tornadoes, people are always in bathtubs? <laughs> so it turns out, uh, you know, if you think about that old classic bathtub that you see on, you know, cartoons, it's big and it's heavy and it's got really stiff, sturdy walls. One of the things that we're going to talk about later on with safety is that, you know, when you're trying to take shelter from a tornado, for example, we want you to put as many walls between you and the outside as possible. And for most people, that's a bathroom. And it turns out if you can actually get inside your bathtub and say, drag a mattress over the top of you, that helps protect you and kind of keep you in this protective environment in case, you know, something awful happens like your house starts to come down and like the walls start to collapse or the roof comes down if you're inside something that's very strong and very sturdy that helps keep you safe and bathtubs actually do a pretty good job of that and this is also the reason why people put storm shelters inside their home you know something that's built to kind of withstand those sorts of impacts okay great i'm going to hold on to the rest of them because i know you got a lot more cool stuff to come okay so one question that i do want to ask you guys is how you know, when we're talking about tornadoes form, like where do you think they actually form? And I've got four locations listed up here. And if you've ever seen a radar image of a, of a storm that's producing a tornado where it's got all the colors on there that indicate that there's more rain or more hail, things like that. I've got four locations listed, A, B, C, and D. What do you guys think? Where is the location that a tornado would form on this image? Does anybody know? All right, kids, put your meteorologist hat on here and see. Um, you can answer A, B, C, or D. Let's see. Duncan thinks it's B. So does Kylie. Um, Melissa thinks it's D, but she's not entirely certain. We're, get, we're getting a lot of variability here. Uh, okay. A lot of Bs. Um, let's see. A lot of Bs. A lot of Bs. And yeah, that seems to be the most common one. And I think if I had to guess early on, I probably would have picked B because that seems like that's the strongest part of the storm, right? But it turns out it's actually location C. And there's a reason why that is that location. And if we start talking about how a storm works, and we'll, we'll explain this over the next couple of slides, but you have this updraft, right? It's, it's sucking air up off the ground and it's actually forming the storm. And you can see this on days when clouds start forming and they start growing up and billowing, it looks like cauliflower almost. And that updraft is what's kind of feeding the storm and it's driving it. Well, that air that goes up, it can't stay up there forever. So it's got to come back down. And it turns out it comes down in two locations. One is called the forward flank. It's kind of this forward area of the storm. So if you were in the path of the storm, it's the first part of that storm that you're going to start to experience. But when that air comes back down, it's really cold and it's wet and it's got a lot of rain and maybe some hail in it. And that cold, wet air mass creates what we call a boundary and that's what that like blue line is with the blue triangles on it because the air outside of that is really warm and it's really humid and those two air masses don't really mix so if you've ever been outside on a day when a cold front comes by for example maybe it was you know kind of a nice day out and then a cold front comes by and all of a sudden the temperature drops and it gets really really cold that's an example of a boundary and the storms that we study produce the same sorts of boundaries just on very small scales and that forward flank downdraft air is one of those. There's also a rear flank downdraft. It comes down in the back and it works the exact same way, but it's a little bit different. Maybe it's not as cold or it's not as moist as that forward flank air is. And then, like I mentioned earlier, you have your inflow air, which is just the normal, warm, humid air. And the reason why that tornado happens where it does is because that intersection right there and kind of that little notch is where all of those air masses interact. And that interaction is really, really important. And that's what we're studying right now, is looking at the interaction between those boundaries and the sort of conditions that it creates in that very small environment that can lead to the production of a tornado. So that's why that tornado happens in that area. And it's not just this clashing of air masses, if you've ever heard that description, where you, know, you have just cold, dry air and warm, humid air, and they hit each other, and then magically there's a tornado. It's much, much more complicated than that. It can happen on very, very small scales, too. So when we talk about studying tornadoes and studying supercells, these are the types of things that we're studying right now, that we're studying today. So what 
does that boundary actually do? Like, why does it matter? So if you think about the ground and the black line right there is supposed to symbolize the ground, right? As you get higher above the ground, your wind speed and your wind direction might change. So maybe at the ground, you've got a little bit of a wind. And you go a little bit higher and the wind gets a little stronger and you go a little bit higher and the wind gets even stronger. And then if you keep going higher, you know, maybe you're at the altitude that planes fly, for example, and that's a picture of the NOAA P3 Hurricane Hunter. So you have what's called wind shear. And if you think about what wind shear does, it can actually cause the air to rotate because that higher speed air is gonna curl downwards towards the ground, right? And it causes the air to spiral. And we call this vorticity. And it's a really weird word to think about, but if you wanna imagine what that air is doing, think about a football. If you go throw a football in a spiral, that football is spiraling in the same direction that that air would be spinning, right? And that's on the ground. But if you add an updraft to the storm, if you add something that's going to take that air and it's going to suck it in, what happens is that air gets turned vertically and that spin starts to turn to a different direction. So instead of that football spiral being kind of, you know, up and down as it spins, now as it's pointing vertically, it's spinning left to right or, you know, right to left, depending on which direction the motion is. And that's what leads to the storms to rotate. And you can see that in that picture. That's basically the updraft of the storm. There's no other precip around. It was what's called a low precipitation supercell. So everything else is, is a, away from it. You know, there's no clouds, there's no rain, nothing. It's just the updraft. And you can actually see the rotation in that storm. So that air gets drawn into the storm and it turns upward and it changes that rotation. And that rotation in the storm is what leads to those boundaries forming and what leads to the, the formation of rotation at the surface. And when that air comes back down, it has different characteristics because of the way the storm adds precip to it or evaporates things off. There's a lot of changes that go into that air. So when we look at those boundaries, what we're looking for is rotation similar to what this is along those boundary edges. So let's put it all together and we'll pause after this because I'm sure you guys have questions, but this is a video that I took near Dodge City, Kansas, a couple of years ago that kind of shows the evolution of a tornado. And you see a lot of the same sort of features that we saw in that previous video, right? If you guys remember, you can pick out the wall cloud that's here and you can see a lot of rotation that's associated with it. And this video is sped up just a little bit. It didn't happen quite this fast because we're moving around pretty quickly. But you can watch that tornado change and move and things like that. But if you notice that tornado seems to be getting a little bit further away, right? And that wall cloud isn't quite as defined. It seems like it's further behind us. But now there's this feature that's closer to us. It's kind of right above where that camera stand is. And that seems to be a lot closer. And it doesn't really seem like it's attached to the tornado behind it, does it? And the reason why is because storms can cycle where it can take that tornadic circulation and it kind of leaves it behind. And it pushes it out the back of the storm and it can create new areas of rotation that are maybe closer to you or in a different location. So when we study these, we have to try to figure out, okay, well, why did that tornado get pushed out the back and why is it creating a new area here? And this storm actually went on to produce, I think, 13 different tornadoes. Uh, it actually produces one just after the video right here. So there are a lot of changes that can occur. Now, before I go any further, does anybody have any questions? <laughs> What do you think, Sean? I'm sure there are tons of questions. Yes. So you you hinted at something just a minute ago um, about what direction when you were explaining the football. Um, and so Duncan asked, what what direction do the winds in a tornado turn? So most of the time, and, and this does change because there are some tornadoes that are different, tornadoes spin cyclonically or counterclockwise if you think about looking at the face of a clock it goes the other direction and that's because of the pressure difference it's inside the tornado and just the way it forms with relation to the storm and things like that most of our tornadoes spin in that direction but there have been what we call anti-cyclonic tornadoes where they actually spin the other direction and understanding why those form one way or another are still questions that we're trying to ask so there's a lot about tornadoes we really don't know Wow, that's cool. I didn't know that either. Um, okay, so some other questions we had. I got a good one, um, and I apologize because I can't. I I would I would not be able to pronounce this name properly. I want to say, um, is it Kyrael? Um, would like to know if we don't know where the tornadoes are going to go. How do you know when you get a tornado warning? How do you know where to go to be safe? Like that is an amazing question. And we are going to cover safety kind of towards the end of this. So we'll circle back to this. 
But to answer that question right now, what we know right now, we don't necessarily know why this storm produces a tornado or that storm doesn't, but we do know large conditions that are favorable for tornadoes. So that's why we give things like tornado watches that tell people, hey, today is a day where you might wanna to have to pay attention to the weather, there could be tornadoes. And then when we have a storm that we think is going to produce a tornado, we issue a tornado warning. And that's something that the National Weather Service does. And they issue that warning because they've seen a report of a tornado or it looks like that it might produce a tornado. There's a lot of things that can cause them to want to issue that warning. And as soon as you hear that warning, the last thing you want to do is wait. You want to take action immediately. You want to have a plan in place. You want to go find a shelter and whether that's in your house, you know, if you've got somewhere else that you want to take shelter in that's not your house, you know, hopefully you're already there planning on it, you know, that kind of thing. So that's when we need you to take action, not go stand outside and, you know, look at the sky and try to see it. You know, we don't want you to do that. We want you to you know, take shelter immediately. And we also use radar to track tornadoes, right? Yes. So we have some idea of where the path, uh, where the tornado is and, and to get people away from that path. Right. And the tornado warning is is kind of giving that information. Right. So when the Weather Service issues a tornado warning, it's it's almost like a it's not a cone. It's more like a rectangular type shape, but it's meant to indicate a path where areas really, really close to the tornado are in the immediate path. And then further on, they think it's going to be there in maybe five minutes or 10 minutes or 20 minutes, things like that. It's a lead time. They're trying to help people that are along that expected path take shelter in advance so that they're not trying to do it at the last minute. Great. Um, Brooklyn wants to know, can tornadoes start on one side of a mountain and go over a mountain and then disappear in the valley? Or do we know? Mountain meteorology is really, really hard. I have seen, I have never personally seen a tornado in the mountains, but I have seen other people take photos of tornadoes in the mountains where they seem to go right up the mountainside. Um, it would probably depend on the height of the mountain. Um, I've not really done any research into that, but especially for like smaller terrain features, I don't know if one would probably go over like the Continental Divide, for example, because it's a really, really tall mountain. But there are smaller mountains or smaller hills. I mean, here in Oklahoma, we have some mountains in the, the southwest part of the state that aren't really all that tall. And I've definitely seen tornadoes go right up over the top of those and come down on the other side. So just because there's some terrain feature in the way, it doesn't mean that it's gonna protect you from a tornado or things like that. Um, <clears throat> so they can go up and down both sides. Um, it might cause it to form, it might cause it to dissipate. There's a lot of interaction there that we have yet to figure out. And do what tornadoes, when they, they pick things up, does do what they pick up impact the storm itself? Like can things, can they be slowed down or, or speed yes. up? Or that's called debris loading. And I have a really, really good friend of mine that's actually working on his PhD at the University of Illinois that's studying that exact thing about how when a tornado hits something and whether that be trees and you know leaf debris or structures or cars, that it actually has an immediate effect on the winds inside that tornado. And that debris can get carried up into the storm and it can have an effect on the storm itself. I've seen reports of hailstones falling where there's you know, little bits of debris that basically are inside the hailstone because they got lofted into the storm and then froze and then came back down to the ground, you know, hundreds of miles away. Um, so the debris itself can actually influence the storm itself, which is a really, really fascinating question. And there are people that are working on that today. So one last one before I let you go on, because I, I love the mobile mezzanet. Um, James would like to know, do do tornado hunters fly into tornadoes just like hurricane hunters do? And if not, how do you get the measurements from inside the, the tornado? So we don't try to take measurements inside a tornado. It's incredibly dangerous to be that close to something like that, no matter how strong it is. Because as you've seen from some of these videos, even if you think it looks like a weak and small and you know not a very threatening tornado, it can change like that. So we don't try to take observations in or even immediately near tornadoes. There are planes that fly into hurricanes and those are known as the NOAA P3 hurricane hunters. And there's a couple of different aircraft that they use to do that. Um, we have used that aircraft to study tornadic storms, but they don't fly into the tornado. It's actually very difficult to fly inside 
you know, supercells or strong thunderstorms because there's a lot of vertical winds that can throw the plane around. There's a lot of icing. There's a lot of hail. There's a lot of lightning. Planes don't like lightning. So there's a lot of reasons why, you know, flying an aircraft inside thunderstorms is actually very complicated. And, and we do it, but we do it in very specific ways and in very specific regions. There are people that have had things that they build that sit at the ground. Um, something where you would, you know, drive up and drop off and, and your goal is to try to get wind speeds, you know, for example, inside a tornado, your goal would be to try to get that hit by a tornado. But it's actually really hard to do. Um, there's a lot of people that have tried it over the years and, you know, they've had some success with it here and there, but it doesn't really tell us a whole lot. And the reason why, and, and I'll answer this and then we'll, you know, continue on. But the reason why is that you've got one point measurement inside this really, really large structure. So that one point doesn't really tell us a whole lot about what's going on inside of things. We need a more complete picture to really understand it. Great, thank you so much. Good question, James. Okay, so that leads perfectly into this next topic, which is how do we actually study those storms? You know, what do we use to actually study them? And the platform that we use to measure things is called a mobile mesonet. It's a vehicle that we drive around that takes observations of things like temperature, pressure, wind speed, wind direction, and relative humidity. And you know, everybody that's seen a severe storm knows that it moves, right? It doesn't just sit in one location and allow us to come up and like, neatly place instruments near things. So we need to be able to move with that. And that's why we have these platforms that can move. So the pictures that I have here are some pictures of a mobile mesonet. And this particular one, we're gonna point out where the different instruments are. So this kind of upside down U shape looking thing that actually has a temperature sensor in it and that's designed to measure air temperature as we go. There's also a relative humidity sensor. How humid is the air? And those are very important factors if you're trying to decide like how much energy a storm might have to work with. We measure wind speed and wind direction. Those are pretty important, you know, knowing where the winds are and where it's pushing things, that temperature and humidity profile that we just sampled, we got to know where it's going. And then pressure. Pressure is that kind of like plate looking thing on the front of that. And there are some other sensors that are on there, but this is kind of the, the core observation that we have. And with these instruments and with these observations, we can basically sample all of the conditions that are feeding into that storm and, and in theory feeding into what's causing that tornado to form. Now, if you're looking at some of the photos, you might see this. And there's a picture of the whole kind of complete unit that you see on the, the truck that we use up there in the upper left hand corner. But if you notice, there's this cage structure that's over the top of the car, right? It's kind of this wire mesh looking thing that's underneath the instruments. Does anybody know what that cage might be useful for? All right, kids. I'm, I don't know if any of you have been in a truck with a cage on top of it, but let's see. Uh, Cami thinks it's just to hold everything. Melissa says to help protect the windshield. Stephanie says hail. Sloan and Olivia say protection. <laughs> Those are all really, really good answers. And you're right, it's hail. So severe storms a lot of times come with hail and hail can come in all shapes and sizes. The biggest hailstone I have ever personally seen was about four and a half inches in diameter. And if you wanna imagine that sitting in your hand, if you've ever held a softball, that's about how big that hailstone was. So imagine a piece of solid ice falling out of the sky, you know, hitting your car windshield like that. And if it does, it ends up doing what you see in the bottom right there, which is just completely shattering your windshield. And that's obviously not something we want to have happen. It's dangerous. Uh, it puts glass into the car. You know, we can't drive anymore. We have to go get it replaced. There's a lot of negative things associated with that. So because we have those instruments mounted so far forward and above the vehicle, and we do that so that the vehicle itself doesn't actually modify the observations that we're trying to take, that also allows us to put that cage on there to try to help protect the hail. And it's designed so that it tries to capture really, really big stuff, the stuff that would do that to your windshield, because I don't wanna to have to replace the window every single day that we try to do some of these observations. And it works really, really well. The highest hailstone that I've tested that cage on is about four inches in diameter and it bounced off of it like a trampoline. So the cage does its job. It protects the occupants of the vehicle and it protects the windshield from actually getting damaged so that we can continue to make these observations in the areas that we need to make them. In. But we talked a lot about surface observations, but there's a lot of the atmosphere that's left, right? You know, there's a picture of a nice storm at sunset. And, you know, if we're driving around in our pickup truck in the ground, taking observations, we're only down here at the bottom, right? 
there's a whole part of the atmosphere that we have yet to sample. And that's all really important information because that storm is working off of it. So we need to be able to observe that whole profile, right? We can't do that with a truck. I mean, we can't just launch the truck into the air, but we can launch a weather balloon. And it turns out the weather service does this twice a day across the entire country. And there are other countries across the entire world that also do this. And all of that information is getting put together because they're all launched at the same time. So these meteorologists that work in, you know, in the United States, for example, at the National Weather Service go out. Right now, it's at 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. to launch this balloon, and they do it all at the same time. And as this balloon goes up, it carries a package on it that measures things like temperature and humidity and pressure and the winds. And then we can put that vertical profile together. And if we do it in all these different locations, we get a snapshot of what the entire atmosphere looked like. And we can put that snapshot together and use that to help start our forecast models, for example, and, and try to figure out what the future is going to do. Meteorology is literally predicting the future, and that's crazy. So we use these balloons to try to measure that atmosphere. Well, we can also do that out of the back of the pickup trucks. We carry helium tanks with us to be able to fill those balloons and launch them in, in near proximity to some of these storms to figure out what the storm is kind of feeding off of and what's driving it. And if you have never seen a weather balloon launch before. Here's a video of some kids that I kind of mentored launching one. So it's a pretty small package. It's very lightweight. Um, and it measures the same variables that the truck measures. And they can go really, really high. I've seen some of those balloons hit 120,000 feet. And it took like two and a half hours to get there. But that's four times the height that planes fly. And that's four times the height of Mount Everest. But the data that we get back looks like what you see in the bottom right there. And that might not mean a whole lot, but that red line is temperature. And the green line is what we call dew point. It's basically a measure of how humid the air is. And as you can see, as the, that line goes up on the graph, it's actually going higher in altitude. And that red line is moving to the left, which means it's getting colder. So we get that profile of what the you know, entire lower atmosphere looks like. And we can use that to try to figure out what storms are going to do. So. We're gonna talk about safety. I just wanna give one quick pause. Does anybody have any questions about any of the observations that we make in storms or things like that? I know we're kind of getting close on time, so. Um, let's see. So Caitlin wants to know what kind of balloon is that? Is that like a regular balloon? So it's made out of latex. Um, most people are probably thinking like a party balloon and that's what they've seen, but it's a little bit bigger than that. It's about four feet in diameter, but it's made out of latex. And, Victor, and uh, Victoria wants to know, and I, I, I meant to talk to you about this during the practice, but um, do these weather balloons ever land in the ocean? Because we've learned a lot about how balloons can impact marine mammals and uh, different things like that. Yes. So obviously the balloons that we launch here in Oklahoma probably don't make it to the ocean, but there are weather service offices along the, you know, the coastline that are a little bit closer. And those balloons probably do. And that's something that we are very concerned about. We are an agency that studies the environment and we care about the environment. We don't want to continue to damage it. So we're trying to find ways to reduce the amount of plastic in the sensors that we use and the amount of electronics and find biodegradable balloons, which are just recently starting to become available. So we are trying to modify a lot of the things that we do so that they don't have that level of impact on the environment. But it's also the only way we have to get that information. And without that data, we wouldn't be able to make any forecasts at all. Awesome. I'm just going to, as a public service announcement, Cami looked it up. For those of you who wanted to know, the biggest hail in the world was in August 1976. It was in South Dakota. Um, and she says it was 18 and a half inches in circumference and weighed almost two pounds. Yeah. So. I think the diameter in the longest dimension was a little over eight inches wide. And it was, it was almost shaped like a football. I think it fell in Vivian, South Dakota. I do know that one. Um, <laughs> nice was a job. Very, very large hailstone. And when you talk about hail that big, hailstones that are on the size of like a baseball or a softball, they can fall at speeds as high as like 120 or 130 miles an hour. So you don't want to be outside. I know people that have been outside and been hit by a hailstone on their arm, and it broke both bones in their arm when it hit them. So don't be outside during hail that big. Hailstones that big can go through your car roof, for example, which is why we have the safety equipment on the vehicles that we do. Cool. Thank you. I'm going to let you continue. 
Okay. So we've talked a lot about tornadoes and severe weather and, you know, things like that. And, you know, we've referenced this throughout the talk a little bit, but there are ways that you can plan ahead for things like this and be safe. And the biggest, biggest thing that you can do is to have a plan, you know, don't be scared, just be prepared. And this picture kind of shows some examples of things that you might want to get ready, you know, cell phone chargers, a weather radio, if you have prescription medicine that you need to take put all this kind of stuff together and, and keep it somewhere so that you don't have to go searching for it at the last minute. If you have pets, make sure you have something to carry your pets in or a leash, you know, waters, flashlight, things like that. Food even. You don't know how long you might need to stay in your sheltered place. So try to have all this stuff ready and, you know, prepared ahead of time so you can just grab it and go or better yet, just put it in your shelter. But also don't forget your shoes. People tend to overlook basic things like that. You know, don't wear sandals if you're trying to take shelter from a tornado. Put on some real shoes so that you have, you know, a hard sole below your feet. And if you need any information about this, please go to ready.gov. It's a government website that we use to try to help, you know, put things together so that there's lists of things that you can put together for hurricanes and tornadoes and all kinds of stuff. It's a really, really, really great resource. So go there and, and look at what kind of things you might want to consider putting into your like go bag or your ready bag or things like that. And, you know, when we talked about warnings earlier, there are a lot of different ways that you can get those tornado warnings. There are local news stations that will broadcast it on TV. They even have, you know, apps on your phone that will warn you or you can look up the weather information on your phone. And, you know, there's weather radios that are out there. There's Facebook and Twitter. I mean, there's all kinds of ways to get it. There's even, you know, sirens that we place outside that some of you might actually live in the country and maybe you don't have a tornado siren. Or maybe you're inside and you can't hear that tornado siren. Those tornado sirens are designed to warn people outside, not inside. So don't rely on one way to get your warning information. You need to have a lot of different ways because one of those might go down. So try to have different ways of, of keeping track and staying weather aware during these severe weather days. And when we talk about shelters, there are places that you should shelter and there are places that you should not shelter. You know, if you have a storm shelter, that's great. If you don't have a storm shelter, shelter in your closet. You know, put as many walls as you can between yourself and the outside world so that you're better protected. You know, drag a mattress in there with you. That's a picture of some weather service people that are doing their safe place selfie. Don't be in a car, especially because you can end up in places like that. That picture in the upper right hand corner is a, a photo of a four lane divided highway. And that's supposed to be going both directions and everyone is going one direction because they're literally trying to run away from this tornadic storm that happened. And that's a really bad idea because all those people are now stuck. And don't take shelter underneath an overpass. They are very, very, very dangerous. That overpass can actually concentrate the air and make it go faster, and that leads to a lot of problems. So when you take a shelter here, find a shelter ahead of time. Know where you're going to go ahead of time. And if you live in a mobile home park, don't shelter in your mobile home. Find a more sturdy structure to shelter in. And that's something that you know, we really wanna to try to encourage people to do, but do that ahead of time. So we've talked a lot about tornadoes today. We've talked about how they form and what we're doing to research them and the types of instruments that we use and things like that. And that's basically it. You guys are all now experts on the, on the current research of tornadoes. And that's a lot of information, but there's also a lot of things that we don't know. And you saw that in some of the questions that we asked. You know, we just we don't know the answers to all these questions. And that's why we continue to do the work that we do. And maybe someday you guys could be a scientist. Maybe you could be the one that figures out why this storm produces a tornado and that one doesn't. I mean, there's tons of people that are doing this work and we always need you know, new ideas and new ways of looking at things and new ways of measuring things. And one of the things about science I think that I find the most interesting is that you don't always get it right on the first try. Science is actually failing over and over and over again sometimes just to figure out what doesn't work. And sometimes that's just as important as figuring out what does work. You know, we know a lot of reasons why tornadoes don't form now. You know, we know the conditions where they don't form. And that's just as important as knowing when they do. So there's a lot of work that goes into this kind of work that we do and this research that we do. So with that, I know we got about five minutes left, so I'm going to open it up to any questions that you guys have. Uh, I did throw my Twitter handle up there. I'm pretty active on Twitter, especially during storm season and when we're doing you know, big research projects and things like that. I put up photos or you know, maybe some small discussions about the work that we're doing and things like that. So if you're interested in this kind of stuff, you know, you're welcome to follow me. I can't always say that I'm going to have something interesting to say, but you know, I, I try to put some fun stuff on there occasionally. So what do you guys have? Well, that is so great, Sean. I've got a few more questions coming in. Um, so one um, by Stefan, uh, can tornadoes make fire if they, because of friction with the ground 
or do fires usually occur associated with the damage of tornadoes? So I don't think I've ever heard of tornadoes making fire from friction on the ground, but I have seen cases where a fire has started from something else that the tornado kind of ingests and it can help spread that. I've also seen pictures of fire nados where you have like a large wildfire, for example, and the circulation, it's it's closer to like a dust devil might be, but it actually forms inside the, the fire itself because there's so much heat there. But tornadoes themselves, I don't think necessarily cause fire just from the friction on the ground. So no shark nados then, do you think? De definitely no shark nados. Okay. Um, what is the, what's your favorite part of your job? Oh, there's a lot of aspects that I really like, but I, I think what drives me the most and what I have kind of the most interest and love in is the fact that it's sort of an unknown. You know, there's no playbook here. There's no set path that there's an answer that we know we have to get to. Every day that we go out and we do this research, it's a new path. It's figuring out what questions we even need to ask, let alone get answers to. And a lot of times when we go out and we have a question that we're trying to answer and we design a field project to do it, we end up asking ourselves 10 more questions that we didn't even know we should be you know, thinking about ahead of time. And I think that's what's so fascinating to me is watching all of these pieces come together and figuring out where we have gaps in and then trying to answer and fill in those gaps. And that's really exciting to me. Yeah, well, it I, it shows. Uh, we can tell how passionate you are about your job, and that's why we're so excited to have you here. Um, I think you talked about this, but Thea just asked if two tornadoes can join together to become one. I don't know that I've ever heard that, um, and it gets it's kind of a, an interesting question because there are cases where there have been multiple tornadoes on the ground at the same time, but there are separate circulations. But what gets really interesting is that when you start getting into large tornadoes, and I'm talking, you know, mile wide, mile and a half, two miles wide, it turns out it's actually not one really, really big tornado. It's a bunch of smaller tornadoes that are all rotating around each other on the inside. Mm -hmm. So sometimes if the outer edge of that tornado isn't condensed, where we have, you know, like these pictures show that nice like cloud material that comes all the way down to the ground, we can see inside of those circulations and you can actually see those circulations rotating together. But those are still part of one parent circulation. Um, I don't know if I've ever seen a case where two tornadoes that are different circulations actually run into each other. Um, most of the time, if, if storms are too close together, there can be a lot of interactions where one storm will interrupt the other one and they might die, they might both go away or they might merge together as one storm, but I've never seen two tornadoes merge together. Um, what about, uh, Jaden wants to know, has there been an impact of climate change on the number of tornadoes or um, damage caused by tornadoes? Or are we seeing change in that respect? That is a great question and it's not something I study. Um, I am focused more on today's weather and looking at you know the, the weather patterns that we see today and what's leading to that tornado today. I don't do any research in climate, so I unfortunately don't have the answer to that one. So that's an actually a good thing to finish on, I think, because we've heard from a few weather folks. Um, so you said you focus on what's happening today, but you're not a for, you, you're not forecasting the weather as part of the National Weather Service. You're right. in a different part of NOAA that focuses on research. Correct. Okay. So. Yep. Um, and let's see, I think we are going to have to call it. And there are so many more questions about water spouts and uh, you know, everybody wants to know the most damaging uh, um, tornado and uh, a lot of death and destruction people are curious about. So um, you guys can look up that, that information, I hope, and uh, do a little research on your own. And please give uh, Sean a uh, nice round of applause for his work today. You were fantastic. We're so happy to have you. Um, thanks for donating your time for all these kids. There were way more questions than I could get to, but I'm going to send those all to you, Sean. And if you and, are and that's one, one thing I will mention, if you guys are on social media, if you do have questions that you want answers to and, and you want to ask, feel free to reach out to me. You know, my, my Twitter handle is on there. You can send me a message and I'll try to answer it. I don't claim to know everything, but I can I can definitely help or maybe point you in the right direction if I can. That would be great. All right. So his 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 handle is Mesonet Man. I'm hoping that none of the 
second through sixth graders have their own Twitter handles, but please ask your parents if they can contact Sean for you. And everybody have a great day, stay safe. Thank you, Sean. We'll, uh, we'll hope to see more from you someday in the future. Thank you. Thank you.